Dr. Ranjit Bra, NHS consultant, physician, and surgeon on the coronavirus, as usual. One day, doctor, we'll be able to talk about something else, uh, but today we'll have to talk about the coronavirus, and in particular, uh, the vaccine. Um, you've heard, I think, I hope, uh, some of the points that have been made on the show already about it, but give us first your view on where we stand right now uh, with the uh, vaccine. Thanks, George. Really enjoying your show. I think um, the first thing to say is that um, uh, your last point wasn't at all uh, stealing my thunder. I think I think it's the point which is um, leading to these crises of confidence that we're seeing now. Um, so I think the crisis of leadership, the fact that you know, you're know you told to do something by our current leadership, as well as the past Labour leadership, and you want to do the opposite, is precisely the problem. The record levels of corruption that we've seen of our government um, uh, you know, cloud everyone's understanding of this issue, whether they believe there's even you know, a virus at all, whether we should take the medicine, whether we can trust you know, anything that's happening, the record levels of privatization of our NHS make people increasingly distrustful of medicine, which is something we see in the private um, sector. Uh, and you see within private healthcare systems, there's huge levels of distrust because there's a clouding of, you know, the interests, the health interests of the population and the population are always overwhelmingly the working population on the one hand, and the business interests and the profit making of huge and very wealthy corporations on the other and where those things get conflated you know that it's a free-for-all of opinion where we are on the vaccine currently um I, we, we will be having as you've said before 800,000 doses made available over the next the coming week i have been contacted for instance um and told that that vaccine will be available to me this coming week it will be the pfizer biontech vaccine that is the mrna vaccine that is the vaccine that has to be as you said stored at minus 70 or 80 degrees c and it's precisely for that reason that um one that there's a relatively small number of doses two that the the conditions of storage and transport mean it will be easiest to distribute around certain central facilities close to the nhs but essentially in the first instance it will be offered to it seems to me NHS staff who are a high risk group, relatively speaking, in that uh, a large number of them are actually relatively old, have comorbidities themselves, uh, and obviously are working in, in on the front line. And we saw six or 700, I think I think over 600 deaths of health and care workers. 600, in the uh, that includes uh, care homes, yeah? Uh, uh, that's right, care workers, Georgia. Um, so that, that's where we are. Uh, I have been, I think, uh, offered the, the vaccine. I'm likely to say yes and take the vaccine, just as I think I heard you indicate. I've been watching the show uh, that you would too. And I think that will be most people's response. Um, in the first instance, actually, there are relatively few doses. So beyond the healthcare workers, I think likely it's going to be rolled out in, uh, in care homes, who are, I think are most vulnerable uh, population, and then probably offered on a tier basis uh, to the eldest and sickest within our society, but still the vast majority won't receive it this year, I think. So this is not the end um, of COVID, even if we were to assume perfect efficacy and perfect safety uh, of, uh, of, the, of the vaccine, George, and perhaps we should talk a little about that too. Yes, uh, but before we do, um, uh, why does it have to be stored at such an extraordinary low temperature? Uh, well, well, this is not um, a, a, a common or garden vaccine. The, most of the vaccines that we have, um, the initial vaccines, the polio vaccine, for example, were based upon an inactivated version of the actual virus itself. And that's a protein. Those proteins can be stored at cool temperatures in fridges. And we're used to having our childhood vaccinations, or our children have vaccinations, going to see the clinic nurse, perhaps at your local general practitioners, and then being stored in fridges, being taken out and administered to you, me, uh, our children. And that's how we think of vaccines. And the protein vaccines, the inactivated vaccines, that is the model uh, that's been used overwhelmingly uh, by the Chinese. They have five vaccines, as you said, made, made by three different companies. All of them are essentially the inactivated uh, protein vaccines. They've been given to a, a million uh, uh, Chinese citizens in total with incredibly good safety profile. And those are storable essentially at, uh, at room temperature or just below. So those would be much easier to distribute. These ones are mRNA. Uh, anyone who has worked with RNA or mRNA, I myself used to do a trial or participate in a trial where I was um, 
isolating uh, uh, mRNA from uh, patients with aneurysms. Aneurysms is, a, is a, a, a condition that I deal with surgically, but we're doing medical investigations into the genetics of aneurysms. And if you extract um, RNA and DNA from cells, it's unstable. And so to preserve its structure and function, uh, it does need to be uh, stored at low temperatures. And minus 70, we used to have to put it in dry ice, so with, with a carbon dioxide, the stuff that uh, uh, produces the smoke for effects on, um, on TV screens and cinema productions. Um, but we use that to, to keep a, a temperature of minus 70 whilst transporting it uh, within kind of rapid delivery mail system. This obviously will be far larger numbers, so lorries and and large uh, low temperature fridges will be needed, and there aren't enough of those to supply the vaccine to everyone in the country at the moment. Um, I mean, th these statements are being produced, um, which really are just the initial press release of the company themselves. They've been released and 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 reproduced by agency after agency, by the government, and then the government circulated them to other people. And then I've even had it from the Royal College of Surgeons. But essentially, it's I can see it's the same document cut and paste that's delivered uh, by the company themselves. So that we, we are at the point where they're assuring us that they have a great uh, level of knowledge and experience of distributing uh, cold vaccines. But really, uh, this would be uh, a world first. And certainly to imagine that the entire world could take uh, such a vaccine uh, would be far-fetched scenario, George. Yes, uh, quite. I mean, portability within our country is uh, one problem, and it's a big one. Portability internationally uh, to poor countries uh, with less reliable electricity supply and so on would be impossible. I think that's right. And I think it's very unlikely that this uh, vaccine will get widespread currency in the world, partly for that reason, partly because it's a, a new technology and partly because actually, you know, the results, as, as one of your callers was saying, really haven't been adequately published. We have to assume that they've been uh, shared fully and scrutinized by the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare uh, Regulatory Authority, and that uh, the safety data is good. But so far, all I've seen is that a press release stating that the safety data is good. So I, I hope it is, and, and I'm sure it is for that small number of um, of patients who participated in the trial, which is 44,000, makes it a large trial, but a very small number compared to the numbers who are about to receive that vaccine. And I look upon, uh, you know, this uh, this next wave of injections of the NHS as being the largest phase of, of the trial so far. Uh, and we will have more information. I hope that there will be very rigorous uh, screening of the patients, uh, who my colleagues really, myself and my colleagues and other people around the country who take the vaccine and uh, I hope that it will prove to be safe and efficacious as indicated. But it does concern me uh, that the, the, the results haven't been published. There's not really been peer review, uh, that the follow up peer, period is very short, that we're assured that you know this works for all people in all countries and all parts of the world. Um, but we haven't seen really whether one arm is comparable to the other. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of very standard. Again, I, I have um, designed and run randomized controlled trials and it's a very rigorous process. And so, you know, you have to produce a power calculation. You have to show what size of effect you're expecting to see between the vaccinated arm and the non-vaccinated arm, design your trial accordingly and publish that data normally in advance. And I've not, I've not been able to find that when I'm looking for it on the web. You have to uh, share your results in a certain way, be very rigorous about the statistical methodology that you use. You have to normally peer review um, your your process show that it's very rigorous and it's double blinding and show that the two arms really are the same, that the, the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated arm, are they comparable? And if we really look at this trial, and if even if you pull everyone, really you're looking at the unvaccinated arm uh, having a, a far less than 1%, maybe half of 1% or slightly more uh, of them contracted the virus. And that's, you know, that seems very low. If we're really talking about the United States, and Britain, if we look at the current figures in the United States, 15 million people have had um, the uh, the virus. It means that um, far more probably than 1% of the population have had the virus. Indeed, they're talking about close to 1% of the population having died. So, you know, 66,000 out of 66 million would be 0.1%. The, the figures don't seem quite to add up. Uh, certainly, if you look at the, the hotspots, we think somewhere between 5 and 20 percent uh, of some populations, high-risk populations, will have already had COVID. Um, if that's the case, you would expect to see a far higher 
um, number of people within the non-vaccinated arm contracting the virus. It doesn't seem right that people who haven't had the vaccine are also protected within the trial from getting the virus. So it, there are many questions, I, I agree, which are left unanswered. And I think the, the best way to answer them is simply to publish the data, let them be, be scrutinized. And that's kind of unanswerable. That, that's uh, something that we can all believe in, other than those who will never be convinced and will never be convinced by the technology of vaccination. And I'm, I'm clearly not in that camp. You aren't, most people aren't. Vaccination in general is a good technology, but this, this is a, a new uh, kind of vaccine and they've not been transparent in the way they publish data. And as we were talked about yesterday, they, they had a conference and said they would start using, you know, celebrities to to push the vaccine. Matt, Matt Hancock has said he'll have the vaccine live on TV. I've even heard that the Queen, though she won't have it live on, on TV, will let it be known that she's had the virus. So all of these kind of media tactics to promote um, a, a vaccine rather than simply sharing the data and letting us scrutinise the knowledge base, which would be normal. I think add to uh, people's sense of disquiet. So I, I agree with you, probably most people will take the vaccine if offered. Uh, talking of questions, doctor, uh, they're, they're banking up here. Would you be so kind as to listen in to uh, some of these calls? Absolutely, love to. Uh, Wayne in Cheshire. Go ahead, Wayne. It's a pleasure to be on the show. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, um, I'll, I, I think I'll be one of the first to be... Um, asked or ordered to take the vaccine but this this first one the Pfizer one I will not be taking it um I've done a lot of research on it by on the government website and the Pfizer website and all to all to your media I've come to the conclusion that well it actually says that this is the one that we're about to have changes your cells on a genetic level now the other vaccines such as the Russian Sputnik etc they are made the old-fashioned way, the same as when you get a flu jab. Now, I'm willing to take that, but I am not willing to have my genetic level on my cells to be changed in such a way that we don't know what are the side effects for the future. Plus, another concern of mine is that this one is $38 a vaccine. The Sputnik one is $8. Why aren't we using that? To save well, uh, that, the, the, this is a question Dr. Brown and I have spoken about many times. Uh, not only is the Russian and the Chinese vaccine uh, uh, more efficacious, more widely trialed, uh, but it is virtually at cost. It's $8 uh, as opposed to, what did you say, Wayne, more than 30 38 37 30 nearly $40. Dr. Brar, uh, what do you say to Wayne's points? I think I agree with the, the substance of what he's saying. I mean, I, the, there is a scientific point on which I, I, I do disagree, Wayne, um, and we've talked about that a little bit before as well. So these messenger RNA is a substance which, so your normal way your cells work is they have a nucleus that's full of DNA, and that DNA carries a code uh, which can be transcribed or translated into messenger RNA that goes outside the nucleus into the protein manufacturing a mechanism, the Golgi body, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, these parts of the cell which make proteins. Um, and that is then um, used in these uh, ribosomes, uh, which then translate that into a protein. So really, there's not a huge difference between giving the mRNA and giving the protein. It's just there's a stage whereby your cellular apparatus, just as it is affected by a virus and produces certain proteins, so this, this um, vaccine will encourage it to create a protein, and that protein happens to be the spike protein that is displayed uh, uh, by the um, uh, certain parts of the immune system uh, to, your, to your white blood cells, and so your required immunity then is able to make antibodies. So it's just a way of training your own body to make antibodies to a part of the COVID virus. I don't think it's true to say, you know, I've seen these kind of, um, and, and, and that is just a false claim. And it's sad, it's, that's a misleading claim to say that this is going to affect the ge genetic structure of the people who take it. That, that's not true. I mean, living in the world affects genetic structure, sunlight affects genetic structure. So the, your genes don't exist in, a, in some kind of a pristine isolation from the material world around it. But this isn't dangerous in terms of reprogramming or introducing some new aspect on a reproducible basis uh, to your genetic code that will affect you or your or future. That, 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 that is not true. But on um, your other points, that no, it's expensive. Uh, no, what, about the, what about the Sputnik point? $8 as against 38 Well, I think, that's, I think those are very true. I think, you know, if you see, uh, and uh, you know, there's a level of 
propaganda here. You know, if you see that our, yeah, I, I guess capitalism to an extent is is in is incapable of existence without uh, without corruption. Without, and we've seen the NHS being corrupted by this revolving door. The ch the chief managers of the of the NHS are people from private industry. In fact, the the person who runs the NHS, uh, Sir Simon Stevens, really is a sign of of the of the private health insurance. So, uh, you know, the the ethos is corrupted uh, by the, the higher levels of so-called public service in the NHS, in government, serving the private sector. And we've seen that there's a classic example in Tony Blair, someone who served the oil sector, served the armaments manufacturer, has retired from government, has been given huge amounts of lucrative jobs and advisory contracts, and now is a multimillionaire himself with 400 million. On a small scale, you're seeing a similar thing where it does seem that our government are very protective of the interests of certain massive Western multinational companies. It doesn't make sense financially for our government not to take the cheapest and most efficacious vaccines, which happen to come from, you know, Chinese companies and, and Russia. But they, they absolutely won't do that. They've poured scorn on their results. They've poured scorn on um, the uh, tr whether we can trust their science. There's a, there's a degree of chauvinism involved in that. There's a degree of uh, great world power involved in that. But there's a, just a straightforward degree of corruption. There's a close link between our government and these companies. So there's un quite unquestionably the case that, you know, this is a relatively uh, new technology. It has the least uh, well-published uh, results so far. And so how it has been rushed through without really a level of public scrutiny, whereas we have uh, had pour, cold water poured all over the efforts of the Chinese and the Russian. Actually, more and more, they just left out of the media. You, you could imagine at the moment that they didn't that they exist. They don't exist. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Let's uh, take Tom in Liverpool. Tom. Hi, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, Welcome. I've, I'm I'm also um, just concerned, not so much, I'm, I'm not an anti-vaxxer and never would be kind of down that path or, or train of thought, um, but I've, I've been reading the actual published government document of the side effects and the um, possible uh, possible adverse re reactions to the vaccine. I've actually got it up now while I'm speaking, just so I don't misquote it in any way. Um, and other than obviously some of the side effects being the pain and the the the, the general side effects of vaccines and stuff like that, it, it has some concern in sentences in the report, such as um, effects on fertility. It is unknown whether the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine uh, BNT12162 b 2 has an impact on fertility. So it just outright states that it it, it is unknown what kind of effect is going to have down the line. Um, on fertility in general, um, and that's all it says about that. Um, I, I, I didn't know that. that. Good, uh, good question, Tom. Let's hear Dr. Bra on that. I mean, uh, thanks uh, for that question. So, I mean, uh, the, the general side effects that have been published for all the vaccines, regardless of the technology that I have seen and been familiar with, are the ones we'd expect in terms of pain, swelling, a little bit of fever, headache, malaise, fe in other words, feeling a little bit unwell sometimes mostly mildly, sometimes for a bit longer. So I, I must say for, I mean, the, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, trial was briefly stopped uh, when there was a case of transverse myelitis, which is a kind of a inflammation of the spinal cord. But ultimately that was found to be, we are informed, not related to the vaccine. So the trial was restarted. I haven't seen deaths. I haven't seen very serious consequences. The, the most serious one likely to be the case is some kind of allergy. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, even if a small percentage of people develop some kind of allergy to one of the uh, vaccines, then, you know, that, that, that could have serious implications in terms of its safety profile. But that, no, that hasn't been reported in any of the data I've seen. So, I, you know, to say it, it's unknown, it's, they've been saying it's unknown the effect on pregnant women because pregnant women weren't included in the trial is my surmise from that. Though, again, the exact structure and nature of the trials really haven't been published in detail, so it's hard to say. Um, so they're, they're not recommending that pregnant women um, uh, take take the vaccine. But fertility, I've not seen any uh, implication that it would. I'm not sure the mechanism by which it would f affect fertility. So I think this is simply in the realm of unknown at this stage. And while that's disquieting, there's an extent to which every new medicine, you know, when it first is introduced, 
ha we don't know its effect on a huge number of people. And all medicines which are introduced have an ongoing system of reporting, whereby if a number of cases of a suspected adverse event linked to that medicine come to light, this should be flagged up to the regulator. Use of that medicine should be temporarily suspended or that an investigation should be con conducted to see whether there tr truly is causality. So this level of scrutiny, I would absolutely expect should attach to this vaccine as it's being rolled out, as it would be to any other uh, any other medication. But I don't know, uh, I haven't heard of any specific problems with um, with the reproductive system. Uh, thanks for that, Tom. Uh, there's a call from China, uh, Hong Kong in China, from Christopher. Go ahead, Christopher. Yeah, how are you this evening, George? Pleasure to be on the show and uh, pleasure Lovely to be to on the show. Lovely to hear a Welsh actually. accent coming from China. Go ahead. Yeah, I do like my accent as well. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Ranjit's been quite correct in most of the observations he's made with regards to uh, the UK and NHS uh, rollout of the Pfizer uh, vaccines. Uh, no complaints there, actually 100% on the ball. Uh, with regards to what's happening here um, in uh, Asia Pac, uh, actually there's quite a lot ha happening, I must say. Um, presently, we've got five, plus China has five registered uh, vaccines with uh, WHO, World Health Organization, and we've got another one coming online now. So that's 600 vaccines from China. Very good news. The bad news is uh, Asia Pac's also seen uh, a large uh, uptick in um, COVID-19 infections over the past three weeks. Um, Indonesia is being hit um, severely. Philippines being hit severely. Hong Kong, where I am, uh, is being hit significantly. We're back on uh, shutdown again. Japan, Tokyo, 500 cases a day. South Korea, 1,000 cases a day. Uh, it's not looking good. Um, these the numbers are minuscule, of course, compared to ours. Oh, com the, compared to uh, Europe, these are small numbers. Um, but given the effort that's been undertaken to contain the pathogen, it gives an indication of how aggressive the path pathogen is um, in uh, the transmission rate. So here in Hong Kong, we've had a very large outbreak centered around, believe it or not, um, come dancing uh, dancing places, 21 in fact, around 1,500 people involved in that being tested and traced. Of those people, more than 600 are infected. This is all in the past three weeks. Uh, we've had more than 1,000 infections in the past four weeks. We have 31 people in a critical condition in hospital and 305 people in a serious condition in hospital. And this is in a bloody country that's kept a firm, solid lid on what's been happening. So, very uh, powerful call, Christopher. Uh, I'm very grateful for it. Dr. Bra, last one. Uh, tell us uh, how you respond to that. Well, I think it's right. It shows it's a global problem. We, with this week, actually, in terms of the, the virus overall, in terms of tested cases, has been the worst on record. So uh, there's been an uptick of 5 million cases this week. And we've seen days where uh, almost 700,000 people around the world uh, have contracted the virus, by, uh, test proven, and 13,000 deaths. So it shows you that uh, China is taking this very seriously, precisely because they've been so effective you know, in uh, stopping their, shielding their, their, their population through u amazing use of public health measures. They limited the virus in the first instance to less than half of 1% of of their population. But that means that much more than 99% of the population uh, are vulnerable to it. So vaccination has a big role to play there. They, as you quite rightly say, have four and you say five now, so that's great, uh, vaccines. I think uh, all the ones that I've seen have been uh, the relatively old-fashioned technology, but tried, tested, proven of uh, an in inactivated uh, uh, virus. They've given it to more than a thousand, uh, sorry, a million uh, people, and it has a, a fantastic state safety profile and efficacy so far. So they are getting ready, as they are in Moscow and other places, to start mass vaccination campaigns, and it will have a tremendous role in allowing them to move 
into normalcy because when it's so prevalent around the world, you know, when the United States has got up to 15 million uh, and, and almost 300,000 deaths, 288,000, 289,000 deaths, um, there's the constant risk of reintroduction from the rest of the world uh, via China's very extent and, and other countries' very extensive transport links. So vaccination unquestionably will have a role to play uh, in, in limiting the impact of coronavirus and in a sense, a bigger role for those who've been more successful at curtailing its spread through public health measures. George. Dr. Bra, thanks as always. Very, very grateful to you. And thank you, Christopher, in China uh, for that call. Give me a 60 second break. Count them. Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Want to know how international issues fit into local ones and how local issues fit into international ones with the historical context to tie them together? Well, we're bringing it to you all by any means necessary. Tune in weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to hear me, Jackie Lukeman, alongside my co-host, Sean Blackman. By any means necessary, your guide to connecting the social, political, and economic movements shaping the world around us. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. 